I'd like to welcome you to the Mako Museum of Natural History. Our laboratory uh, measures the stable isotope compositions of different materials and uh, we use stable isotopes. Those are the different forms of carbon or nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, uh, very precisely on a mass spectrometer. And the mass spectrometer tells us the different forms of carbon, the abundances of those different forms. And from that, we can come out and take, uh, we can make interpretations of source materials, of uh, things like uh, temperatures in oxygen 18, we make those measurements. Uh, hydrogen isotopes, we can tell latitudes of uh, where uh, an organism might have been living, uh, where the water that they're drinking comes from. And with carbon and nitrogen, we're able to tell uh, things like the kinds of foods that a person might be eating. So where this really comes into use is that we can go to pretty much any kind of situation. My students actually laugh about this, that I try to solve all problems using stable isotopes, but it's pretty surprising how frequently we can have application. We are looking at everything from origins of life, you know, so we're looking at rocks like this that are meteorites. So this rock is about four and a half billion years old, and inside of it are little uh, small amounts of organic matter that were formed in outer space perhaps four and a half billion years ago. And so we extract them and then we analyze those compounds for their isotope compositions, which then tells us we can look at their chemistry to find out what the Earth was like four and a half billion years ago before there was any life on Earth. Well, this is a tailbone from a Tyrannosaurus rex that lived about 100 million years ago. And inside of that bone are organic materials that when the animal was alive, when this Tyrannosaur was alive, that we've been able to uh, pull out those compounds and look at the organic matter, and we measure their stable isotope compositions. And once we authenticate that these probably are of the same age as the bone, that's always a crucial element, that we can then go out and say, oh, that tells us that this is the kinds of things that that animal must have been eating. The, uh, Ceratopsids, you know, these are the, the, the cow equivalents, and these guys were the lion equi equivalents of the, of the day. So this is 100 million years ago. Hair, which is a continuously growing protein, uh, and so it has an inscription of how much food comes from C3 or C4, basically on a daily basis. You know, your hair is growing on the order of a centimeter or two per month, and so there is a signature of your foods that shows up in your hair. Uh, basically, it's about a week later. If you, to change, if you were to change your diet completely today, those foods that you had for breakfast this morning, like that banana that you had for breakfast, would actually show up in your hair within about a week. Uh, some of the work that we're doing is uh, we're trying to decipher the diets of humans that live hundreds of thousands of years ago uh, from South America. And these are from a location that was in Peru. Uh, these are people called the Moche. And they lived on the coast of Peru and there actually are pyramids on the coast of Peru. And inside of some of the pyramids are, uh, are some burials. And so these were the, I would call them more the aristocracy, you know, so they're buried inside the pyramids. And then associated with those burials are also people that are being found out in a plaza so next, to the, next to the pyramids. And our question is uh, that who are the people that are out in the plaza? And it's, it's very clear that these people that are in the plaza were sacrificed. You know, they have marks on their bones, like the flesh was cut away and uh, other things like parts of their, their skull has an impression where they got hit really hard and got killed. And so we're looking at their hair and, and the hair of the people that are found inside of the, the pyramids, and we can tell what their diet is. And it turns out the people inside the pyramids had a, a large amount of meat and corn-based meat, so they were eating llamas and things like that probably. And the people that were out inside the, the sacrifice, uh, the, these victims, uh, were people that had lots of fish in their diet, lots of marine foods in their diet, so completely different populations. And what that means is that, you know, the, the people, the moche that lived there, the aristocracy apparently every now and then had some people that lived on the coast that they brought back and they had, and they sacrificed them. This is a piece of baleen from a humpback whale. 
and you, you might glance at it and say, wow, that looks like hair, okay? And it is, That's a, that, this is the baleen, so this is in the mouth of the, of the uh, uh, humpback whale, and so these would be you know, like a couple of meters long, and, but this is a continuously growing protein, very much like your hair or much like your fingernails, it's called a keratin, and as it grows, it's telling us that this is what the animal's eating. So these are the mass spectrometers. You're looking at two, uh, the value of the, the two pieces of equipment here is on the order of a, I would say now, if you went to the store and bought them, they'd be like a half a million dollars. And uh, this is one mass spectrometer, and in this would be a, uh, the stories of the meteorites or the stories of the eagles are being revealed because what we do is we separate individual compounds on the one machine, it's called a gas chromatograph, and then we send those compounds inside the mass spectrometer to measure their carbon-13, the nitrogen-15 abundances. For other, uh, for other samples like the ones from the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico where we're looking at chemosynthetic communities, we have this mass spectrometer. We burn samples at about 1,000 degrees on an elemental analyzer. Here are furnaces. And you can see the cherry glow. That's at about 1,000 degrees on the inside. And there, those gases from that combustion go into this mass spectrometer. And we measure so we, uh, the carbon-13s on the gases that they come into the mass spec. Um, I run a class in stable isotopes. And it has grad students and upper level undergraduate students. And a way to invigorate them about the concept that okay, we're making these measurements and it's really, it's almost like a magical thing because we have these instruments that are, you know, a quarter of a million dollar instrument and we're making these very sophisticated measurements of carbon-13, nitrogen-15 abundances and in order to get them identifying with that a little bit more, uh, we, I actually offer in the class that they should, they could run their own hair or their own fingernails to find out, to get an insight into their diet. And so it's really, it's a, a very simple way to get those students uh, to realize that, well, not only are they, you know, scientists and we are making measurements on a scientific survey of some sort of scientific study, but they are actually also part of the system. And a few years ago, actually uh, 1999, I was contacted by a museum. It's called the Wilton House Museum in Richmond. And they said this is the 200th anniversary of George Washington's death. And can you tell us something about George Washington's hair? Uh, from his hair, can you tell us something about George Washington? And, and so the curator there you know, went in and they had a lock of George Washington's hair that was cut from his head uh, right after he died. And uh, there are these locks that exist around. So I have a couple of strands of his hair. And we determined from the isotope composition that he had uh, a diet that was a mixture of things, like he had a certain amount of like, meats in his diet, but he was also carbon-13, uh, told us he had uh, corn-based foods, and he had uh, wheat-based foods, and he was pretty much a centrist, and that was what the, the, the final conclusion was that for the people at the Wilton House Museum, that he was a centrist in his diet also, and he was a perfect father for the country.